Kwe, Namaskano, and welcome um, to this gathering. I'm delighted that you are here because as I was driving past all the many accidents on the road, I thought it's going to be an empty room and I'm going to have a lot of time to look at the museum. <laughs> um, but I've been to the museum recently, so I, I don't have to relook at it. But thank you all for coming. I'm very happy. Talk, I'm happy to talk about Ernie Smith and the Seneca Art. It's often called the Indian Arts Project, but it's it's all Seneca people, so I'm saying the Seneca Arts Project, um, which it is sometimes referred to. But I'll give you a bit of background for that as we go along. So I just want to start with, um, we all probably know where we are, but in terms of orientation, one of the things I've always been interested in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy as it interacted with European powers was that we were unified enough and strong enough a group that on very early maps we're often bounded like a country in Europe would be bounded. You rarely see that with indigenous nations in the U.S. They usually, we'll say New France and then maybe the names of several different native nations, but on a bunch of 18th century maps it will also Iroquois, of course, is the French name for the five nations, then six nations. English maps tend to say five or six nations. They don't, they don't try Haudenosaunee, <laughs> that's a word, and um, they tend to resist the French title because it's French. Um, but you see the, this kind of boundary, and when I tell students, you know, think of the strange shape of our state. You know, it's a kooky shape when you look at all those square and rectangular shapes out west, and then you have us. But I said, really, it's just along the Hudson and Long Island that are the colony of New York. They have not intruded deep into Haudenosaunee territory, even by the beginning of the American Revolution. So I think of that as the period when we lose our independence. We are not a British colony, we are a British ally. We fight with them, they lose, we lose, right? And they tend to forget all their allies at the bargaining table anyway. So when it came to the Treaty of Paris in 1783, it was like, what allies? What native allies? And we just get left in the dust. The British give away much more than the Americans expect them to give away. Think of the 13 colonies. That's what's fighting for independence. But the British give them all the way to the Mississippi River. They weren't even asking for them. And certainly no native peoples living in that vast region between Haudenosaunee territory and the Mississippi knew that they were suddenly part of the United States of America. So it's a very strange history in that regard. As you know, Haudenosaunee means people of the long house. And what I like about that is it's a metaphor, right? It stands that we have a metaphoric relationship to an architectural form, the longhouse, which is a multi-family dwelling, but in terms of a map of the Confederacy, it's a multi-nation dwelling. So that metaphoric longhouse is stretching from the eastern door near Albany to the western door in western New York, Niagara, right? The Great Central Fire, at Onondaga, near Syracuse, New York today. And that, I say it's not only an architectural metaphor that can be put on a map east to west, but it also tells you something about how the Confederacy lives, meaning in a multi-family dwelling, you have to be very mindful of other families. You can't tell them how to live. They choose how to live. But you all have to live together. And so that's the balance struck in the Confederacy itself. Each of the nations is relatively autonomous. Mohawk affairs are Mohawk affairs. But when things involve the entire Confederacy, attack by an outsider, decisions on major things that will affect other groups, then you meet in council and try to come to a consensus. So it is about, you know, I think, like, how would you get along with each family in a multi-family dwelling? Similarly, how, does, how do we get along with each nation in a multi-nation um, confederacy? And so I like, you know, reminding people of that 
both for the shape of the state, its long extension westward. And you know, we call the, the Seneca, one of their names is Keepers of the Western Door, right? And Mohawk people, Keepers of the Eastern Door, Onondaga, Keepers of the Central or Council Fire. So those are parts of their nomenclature as well. I also like to remind people, so where are we today? These are roughly our territories as we stand today. The Seneca Nations, Cataraugus, Allegheny, I don't know if the oil spoons make it, doesn't make it, and Tonawanda, Seneca community, Tuscarora. Though I am a citizen of Aquasesne, my mother's family moved to Tuscarora area when I was a kid, so that's actually where I grew up. The other half of my family was from Six Nations. So. Um, you have a bunch of Mohawk reservations. The one, only one is in New York State, and that's Aquasesna or St. Regis. And that itself is cut by the Canadian border. So if you're up there, it's a complicated space politically because you have, the border just cuts right across. And you could be on the other side of the street, now you're in Quebec. Across the street, now you're in New York. You're in Canada, you're in the United States. So we have two federal governments we have to deal with. U.S. and Canada, and then we have the state government of New York, the provincial government of Ontario, and it happens to be right where Ontario and Quebec meet, so a quarter of the reservation is also Quebec. It's a mess. It's a mess, right? Um, if you grew up in that Quebec quarter at high school, you'd have to go to a French-speaking school. So everybody moves to their aunties in the English part. <laughs> so, so you don't get two colonial languages on top of it. <laughs> Nothing against the French language, but we don't need another book. Um, so there you have Ganawage, which is right across from Montreal, Ganasatake, very nearby. That's where the Oka crisis was in 1990, over land. Um, Dendenega, another largely Mohawk, though mixed um, on the Bay of Quinte. Gibson, we call it Wakta, uh, which means maple tree. Gibson, largely Mohawk, but a very small population. Then Six Nations of the Grand River, that dotted outline you see around it, that's the original donation. And you can see what happens. As what, you could do that for each of ours. They're all bigger at one point. They just get chiseled away. This inset one is because the majority of the Oneida Nation, which really only has a footprint here, Right, you know where the casino is. They don't own a lot of territory because the great majority of them left in the 1820s and migrated of their own choice to Wisconsin, Green Bay. So that's where the 90% of Oneida people. There's also an Oneida on the Thames in Ontario. So we're spread all over. When I was a kid, I thought of this as, since we're not a contiguous nation you know, anymore, as we had been in older times, I thought of it more as like a constellation you know, of different stars where you say, that's Aries, that's Venus, or whatever. And that, that constellation of nations made up our homeland. And as small and reduced as we are, I have to say, it warms my heart that we're in the place that our, was our original home. I cannot imagine when I talk to people from the southeast, Cherokee or Chickasaw or Creek people, what it's like to think of your homeland as Oklahoma, but you know that you're originally from Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. And that's where all your sacred spaces are. That's where your stories come from. That's where your name places are. And to be hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Um, we don't have that. There are, of course, Haudenosaunee in Oklahoma. There's a Seneca Cayuga reservation there that's largely Cayuga. Um, but it's, it's not as big as some of the larger communities out there. But I, I am glad we're in our homeland. It means a lot to me um, that we've been able to retain it. You know? And it, it takes constant fighting to retain it. You know, you think even, even in the 20th century, when the U.S. government's going to take land by you know, uh, 
eminent domain for a public project, where do they take it? They take it from native reservations. As small as we are, can Zua Dam project in the southern, you know, along the Allegheny River, the Niagara Power project takes a, almost a quarter of the tiny Tuscarora reservation in the 1950s. So these land grabs aren't over, right? Land is lost up at Upper Cessna, along the St. Lawrence Seaway for the St. Lawrence Seaway project, etc. But it's somehow, whenever they need to take land for eminent domain, it's us that they're taking it from, which is peculiar given how small our land base is, but it always has to still be us. But I want to talk about what I'm here to talk about specifically, which is Ernest Smith and the Seneca Arts Project. And it goes back to the New Deal. Um, happily, some of you will know what that means. Telling my 19-year-old students, they're like, I don't know anything, you know, pre-Hanna-Barbera. And um, so there's the New Deal. There's the um, the crash of 1929, there's the Great Depression, and then there's the election of FDR, who hires John Collier to become one of the first more or less sympathetic directors of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Now in the interim, in the 1920s, there had been a study done called the Miriam Report. The Miriam Report was a federal commission on what is the condition of Native American life in 1928, and it's bad, right? That period, say from 1890 to 1930, is really nationally, I would say, the nadir or lowest period for indigenous America. Not only are our numbers going down rapidly, but there are no more independent native nations. Everyone after 1890 is on a reservation. And by 1890, we're already 20 years into the boarding school era. Boarding schools start 1870, Carlisle, and by 1890, they've been going 20 years. By 1930, they've had 60 years of damage to do, several generations. Right? And so this is a low period nationally. And one of the things getting lost, besides language, is our material culture, right? All these beautiful things you see here, this beadwork, this basketry, this ceramic work, a lot of that's being lost and forgotten because there's no one back home to teach it to. The kids are all being sent away. They're not learning their language and they're certainly not learning their arts and crafts of this traditional style and things are getting lost rapidly, especially things that weren't particularly popular. Beadwork always had a popular majority, i.e. white audience, to buy it, right? Um, you could sell it at Niagara Falls or different sites. Beadwork remained popular because it was a form of income for a lot of Native women. But other more traditional things that didn't have a sale value outside, like um, basswood rope making, or burden straps and things like that. This is disappearing. That's just an old technology and so on. So one of the things that Collier does is he says there's got to be, just like there's a new deal for the average American, there has to be the so-called Indian New Deal. And we have to start reforming certain things. One would be if a family doesn't want their kid to go to boarding school, we do not snatch them away. We, we allow that. They don't close the boarding schools, but they don't make them mandatory anymore. Then there's giving back land, not land to Native people just wholesale, but we lost a lot of land on reservations to the Allotment Act in 1887, the Dawes Allotment Act. He helps reverse some of that. And that mostly affects out west rather than us. And then the third piece of this is he says, we should let them get on with their languages. We should not persecute them for their languages or their religious practices and cultural practices. Land of religious freedom, but Native American religions are outlawed by Congress in the 1880s. 
I would say, does anyone know when they became legal again? Some may guess, FDR, 1978, Indian Religious Freedom Act. Thank you, Jimmy Carter. And um, so all these things linger, right, into the 1970s. It's just no one was persecuting us for them. But they were on the books. And Collier says, let's stop worrying about religion. Let them get back to themselves. He wants more native self-governance, but this is where his one big fall is. He intervenes and says, but they should govern themselves the way the U.S. does. You should have a Senate and a Congress and a Constitution. We have traditional constitutions and ways of governing ourselves. Say, among the Haudenosaunee, that might involve clan mothers and choosing chiefs the traditional way. He didn't want any of that. And so he has the Indian Reform Act, the IRA, goes, he attempts to go through, it's blocked by a number of tribes, including the Haudenosaunee, who are very opposed to it, but also other traditional, the Hopi, um, a lot of the Lakota nations. So Collier is a mixed background. This is a picture of, of course, Taos Pueblo, who has nothing to do with us. I put it there with him because his love of indigenous people was really the Southwest. And partly because they lived in villages, like something he could recognize. They lived in villages, and that's hundreds of years old. He didn't have as much sympathy for the mobile peoples of the plains or people that were semi-permanently positioned, like what in Ashoni people. We might live for 15 to 20 years in a space, but then move, move you know, down the road, as it were. He didn't really like that. But so I put that with him more as a kind of reminder that he doesn't universally admire native culture. He admires Pueblo culture. But by extension, he's willing to work with us in his new position. Um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act also goes through as part of the New Deal's um, attempt to shore up indigenous traditional production of material culture. So what the Indian Arts and Crafts Act does, and it's still in position today, and it, has, it still has a kind of formal um, administration within the, uh, within the BIA, is that it it basically says you cannot sell items as Native American items unless they are made by Native Americans. Seems easy. <laughs> but it was protect, protecting Native craftspeople from all the you know, imitators that could pop up and say, well, I could, I could copy that easily and do it cheaper. Right? And so, and that was before the Made in China competition. And there you, still, you still see a lot of junk coming from overseas that claims to be Native American. Um, Native American made in Indonesia, you know. Because um, it's not zealously pursued. They're not out in airport gift shops <laughs> in Albuquerque, where they should be, because that's where all that stuff is being sold. But it, is, it does exist. This symbol is actually, if it was on its side, it's a from a mica piece from the Hopewell dig in Ohio, which would one of the mound, bearing, mound building cultures from over a thousand years ago. So it's, it looks kind of modern, <laughs> but it's actually a symbolic object from the Hopewellian people. There is Collier again with some of his Pueblo friends. But what does this have to do with us? Well, part of the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, was to support artists, writers, historians of all types, right? Native, non-native. So folded into that Indian New Deal was WPA support for indigenous projects. At the Rochester Museum, we have Arthur C. Parker. He is a Seneca um, anthropologist archaeologist, trained in the Western tradition, works for the Museum of Science in Rochester. That museum is closely collect, connected with Morgan, right? Lewis Henry Morgan, who is the so-called founder of American anthropology. Have people heard of him? Um, so. He's a curious figure. He's a 19th century figure. Um, and 
he has a weird entry into studying Haudenosaunee culture. He, this is in the 1840s. He's a lawyer and he's part of a lawyer, like a men's club. They call themselves the Improved Ir Order of the Iroquois by being white, I suppose. And, um, and they're like guys that get together and play Indian in some weird way. And they want to do it more authentically, so they charge him, since he's a scholarly sort, to go interview local Native people, because they do know they're around, right? And um, he meets, by chance, Ely Parker. And Ely Parker is a very highly educated Seneca young man, um, who starts to talk to him about traditional Seneca culture, invite him to the community, both of Tonawanda and other communities, and um, have him actually learn the real truth, not just go back and tell your guys how to do some kind of dance or something. In fact, he never really goes back to that world. He takes a scholarly turn and um, will write one of the first really important ethnologies in the United States in 1850 called The League of the Haudenosaunee, right? which he talks about the structure of the League, its history, our political organization, and a lot about our material culture, which he has illustrated, if you look at the um, pieces from that period, he collects himself and a lot of them go to the New York State Museum in Albany, where they were until, unfortunately, the fire. There's a fire in the state capitol in 1911 that wipes out most of the collection. Though, a good deal of it, a surprising amount, survives. But Ely Parker is really key to remembering that the Morgan collection and Morgan's writings paid a lot of attention to some of these arts that are dying out. So he says, if we contact people at Tonawanda who are interested in the arts and in making, and ask them, do they have you know, access to the tradition, these other traditional forms, he said, that's a project we could support. And so they set up. Um, I did try to include everyone's name that I could find in case people were here from the community because they always ask me. Um, but so he, they set up in an old schoolhouse um, in the reserve and some other buildings, different workshops where people could engage in teaching these things generationally. So they would have older folks that knew how to do it teach young people, and they, you know, they're. They're being paid for it, just like any other WPA artist would be paid. And it was so, it helped you know, keep the wolf from the door, as it were, but it also helped the continuance of these, these traditional forms, which is, I am forever grateful for um, in what I, what I study. Now, we don't have a, you know, an ancient tradition of painting or two-dimensional representation. But there are native artists who adopt that when they start to encounter Europeans and, and the, the stuff to do it in paintboard um, or paints and watercolors, press board and so on. And some of them have survived from a remarkable, I mean, 1820, these things are well over 100 years old. They're on paper. They could have been lost at any point in history. But they have been collected. They can be seen mostly in museums private collections, but I just wanted to say that it's not all beadwork, basketry, and ceramics, that there's also a tradition, a visual tradition. Um, and one of the other things, a term that comes up that my students often ask about is, so we talk about sovereignty always. Sovereignty is the right to rule oneself, you know, it's like independence. But then there are other types of sovereignty, linguistic sovereignty, the right to speak your own language without having it beaten out of it. Um, food sovereignty, the right to plant, grow, gather, and eat your own foods without Monsanto telling you you can't grow them. Um, and another form is visual sovereignty. Visual sovereignty, it's not just the right to draw or paint as you wish, but the right to claim your visual idioms or your <coughs> traditional ways of representation 
as, as important and on par with any art. Not that there's some hierarchy like, well, if you get really good, you'll paint like a Dutch Renaissance painter. That's good for the Dutch Renaissance painter. But there are other idioms, right? There are other ways of, um, so it's not to say, you know, this is good, but it's primitive art. Whatever the art is, is what they're choosing to represent. And so when I look at the forms that you'll see in many of the pieces around here, those idioms that have been part of our visual idiom for centuries, they persist because we believe they carry as much importance as possible. Not that we're, we're not able to do it like a European, right? And so I consider all of these things as part of that larger notion of, of visual sovereignty. So this is Ernie Smith, um, picture of him in a ribbon shirt, the stoa cap. These are the Seneca Reservations of Western New York. Um, he's from Tonawanda. And he and his brother were involved in the, the project, the Seneca Arts Project. And though he gravitated mostly towards painting and illustration. So he, his brother worked in basswood and other things, but he, he worked in a relatively newer form. Probably his most frequently um, reproduced painting is an oil painting of Sky Woman, right, from the creation story of the Mushomi, illustrated here and other places. When she falls from the sky world, captured by the Canadian geese and landed on the back of the turtle, which forms our world. And again, so he's, it's a kind of mixed, mixed idiom visually, because he is drawing on Western traditions. He has somewhat of a perspective in there. But what his focus is on is visualizing an oral history of our culture and saying, just like you might see a picture of the creation or Noah's flood in a stained glass window. He wants parts of our stories, our foundational stories, to be visualized and represented. You'll notice too, um, I was talking to a, a student recently, well, last semester, about Smith, and they said, why does his style seem so different? And I said, any artist's style changes considerably over the years, but also depends on the medium he's working in, right? So this is watercolor on board. It's a lot different than oil. Um, and it's, you know, you can do more things for the type of illustration. Because this is, I think of him as having different um, reasons for his work. Illustration is really wanting to document something and explain it visually to someone else. Whereas a more decorative piece or a kind of almost history painting, which I would consider the first one in, is a more elevated celebration. It's not about documentarianism so much as it is celebrating something. So this, as he imagined, because he would have never seen Hanson Lake preaching a long house, but um, so an imagined scene for him. Similarly, another watercolor of a lacrosse game. This guy seemed to be in a tussle, um, not unknown in lacrosse. <laughs> Little Brother of War and all. But again, um, he was trying to populate, because a lot of these things were being bought by the museum, right? And then he was trying to populate their collection with scenes of all different aspects of our culture. So the sacred, the ancient, the historical, the cultural, like sport, you know, a sport that has gone on, the creator's game since time immemorial and is still an important thing, but a lot of, you'd be surprised at how many, you know, non-native kids from Long Island who play lacrosse don't have a very good idea that it's from our culture. They think it's from Westchester County. <laughs> you know? And um, when you say, like, you know, it's actually ours. Um, so he's, he moves through different styles, right? And um, this is a depiction more of a historical one. So at first, when I first visualized it, I couldn't see what they have, but they're all war clubs. So they're men 
look like they're going to go on a raiding party or a war party, but this female figure, which you can also say, the mother of nations, she is an important historical figure in the unification of the first league of five nations. So you have, you have the peacemaker going around with this message of peace and unity, and you have his helper, Ayanwata, Hiawatha in American English. And the, the two important men, but the third part of that triad is Jugon Sisi, who is a necessary figure in bringing the last people of resistance against the message of peace. In this case, it would be the supporters of Tabadaho, a kind of warlord, sorcerer figure um, who was ruling Onondaga at the time. And they're, of course, the middle. They're the council fire. They're the center of the Confederacy. Without them, it's going to be hard to have this unified group of the Haudenosaunee. So she is the intervention. She is, the, as I said, called the mother of nations because she brings us together, helps win over um, the Tabadaho, and therefore is honored in one of his history. These ones always interest me because they're late in that period, so a lot of these are 1932, some are eight years later. He's doing, again, these are illustrations for traditional, this is a right, woman leaching um, corn. Remember, Punishoni white corn has a very, very tough outside that you can't digest. And so you soak it in lye, lye from ash, um, but you don't, of course, want to eat lye. <laughs> so you rinse it and you really rinse it like your life depends on because it does. And um, so she's rinsing that corn. Because once, of course, that husk is off it, you can not only digest it, but it's a, it's a wonderfully you know, rich, nutrient-rich um, form of food that lasts throughout the winter, can last for years. This is a woman using a, a deer's lower jawbone as a scraper. You know, the teeth are in it. And an ideal corn scraper. So he's illustrating these again for a science museum. This is almost like they would go in a textbook. So they almost have a weird early Disney feeling to them. To me. <laughs> and um, I, you know, they do like not, which is not a bad thing. Um, but they, because they look now more almost um, user friendly. They're the focus. They don't have any backgrounds. It's, they're, they're by themselves. The focus is on the activity. But they're yet another part of his styles that I would say. You can see the date on this very near the end of his life, right? He dies in 71. Um, and these are all owned by the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Not, well, not, I'm sorry, not by the Smithsonian. Um, I think the BIA, they're commissioned by the Indian Arts and Crafts Board within the BIA. 1968 and 69. And so he does a series of um, illustrations again, some on you know, life in the longhouse system, the women's dance. Again, they have still some of that cartoonish figure feeling of the, those last ones we saw. But it really spans a great period. I mean, he's from you know, over 40 some years of, of painting and drawing. And, and preserving these aspects of our culture in the visual medium. And I'm glad they do because this stuff is much more readily available to students of all types. And they learn visually. You can get them involved with beadwork and ceramics and so on, but that takes certain hands-on, you know, you need experienced people working with them on those materials. But this is something they can look at it in a book, they can look at it online, and um, I think that Smith's real contribution, well, one of many, is, is to keep alive these visual idioms well into the 20th and now 21st century through his work with these people like the people at the Indian Arts. I was just going to end this with thinking of the way these visual idioms come into contemporary life. Um, 
many of you know Warren Lyons, um, faith keeper in the Confederacy, um, still with us happily. But this was something he painted back in 1967. And I was talking to him a couple of years ago, because he went to Syracuse University, which we're all very pleased with. And um, I said, what did you major in there? And he said, I was an illustration major. And my first job was for a greeting card company. <laughs> and um, he said, they didn't care about any native thing. But they wanted a lot of like kittens and bows and puppies. And he said, it did about two years of that and it was done. <laughs> um, but this is a very early piece with a peacemaker. And I didn't want to under the great trick piece on the back of the turtle. And then you have the, all the clan animals, the 12 different clan animals kind of peeking around in the trees. And I was, when I was a kid, I was always very fond, I'm bear clan, but I was always fond of the eel clan. It just seemed so exotic. <laughs> eel. Um, and there, you know, the snipe and the hawk and the wolf and um, heron. So yeah, I, the deer. What I like about it too, when we talk about these animals, um, and my grandparents used to, play this trick on us, they'd say, well, what is the leader of the animals? And of course, we'd say, like, wolf, bear, it had to be tough, it had to be, it's the deer, the deer is the leader, because it gives so much of itself to us, to the humans, so it feeds us, it clothes us, it builds our paths in the woods, um, and without it, we couldn't survive, whereas the others have their other function, but just because they're big and strong, and I just like that kind of inversion of expectation because they set us up for like, which is the bear? Like, it's got to be the bear. We're bear. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Um, and every diminutive creature has its, you know, power and, and legacy. So I was loving that. This is Shelley Nero's um, Sky Woman that's in, um, in Art Gallery of Ontario or in the National Gallery in Ottawa. And there she is, falling with the, toward the turtle. We have the Pleiades, the, the seven stars that are called the Pleiades in the European tradition, but are also important in many, many traditions. And um, they are the place in the afterworld where you go. And um, so these, as I said, these kind of visual representations, it's not that someone's constraining them and saying, you have to do native subjects. It is, why wouldn't you do native subjects, right? It's not like, oh, I'm, I'm really good now, so I'm going to do just pure abstraction or some European thing. Why? Um, why not do the things that move you? There's a great Shelley Nero show right now at the um, National Museum of the American Indian in New York. And then, um, as you know, there's one in New York and then there's one in D.C. And you can see Orange work in different places, but yeah, it's. Um, I mean, this is a perfect example when you walk through after maybe thinking about it in this talk, hopefully, and look at some of these things, regardless of the age, what's still important to us in these representations, these designs that some of them are beyond a date that we can give them, right? The sky dome. But it's a motif and a very modern piece, and it can be part of something very really ancient. So that is my main walkthrough, <laughs> um, and I hope it's been useful and interesting to you because it's the type of stuff I love. I just and I love working with my students. I'm very fortunate at Syracuse. We have over 300 Odishani students, and uh, it makes a very different class. When, when they say we, they mean we. <laughs> and, um, when it's a course on Odinishani culture or art, I feel like they feel empowered by it because it's, it's theirs. We're on our homeland. Um, I do like that the university not only flies our flag everywhere, else, but it's the native students who um, gather and welcome the freshman class to the campus because it's our land. <laughs> um, but it's just to say, you are in a place that's not just a place in New York State, 
you're in the center, you're in the capital of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, we are representatives of it, and our culture lives on. And it's given us space to do that.